in this video i'm going to talk about some of the investigative strategies assumed by oedipus in sophocles's oedipus rex and their role in the structuration of the tragedy i will also look at the catastrophe of the play as a release of a spectral version of oedipus that in fact is a consequence of king oedipus's relentless questioning of the limits of knowledge itself sophocles structures his play as a murder mystery with abandoned use of withheld information prolepses and foreshadow foreshadowing techniques as the play opens thebes is a, is in the grasp of a devastating epidemic uh, the only way to scourge the plague is to discover who killed the previous king laius Oedipus takes it upon himself to solve the mystery and we must note that Oedipus's accession to the Theban throne had also begun with mystery solving when he solved the riddle posed by the Sphinx now confronted with another plague years later he is once again determined to rid the realm of the shadow of uh, death and disease uh, Oedipus's first address to his people uh, is a question he says my children sons of cadmus and his care why this in suppliant session with the bows enriched for prayer throng you about my feet while thebes is filled with incense filled with hymns to the healer phoebus and with lamentation with these words sophocles hurls us directly to the center of the action which is really about the inquiry about the death of king laius it is interesting how sophocles structures this inquiry beginning with an appeal to, on oedipus's part to the theban suppliants uh, he asks the old priest present to tell him about the reason behind the supplication speak he says for i you know would give all aid and a speech later however he reveals that he has already sent creon to ask of phoebus by word or deed how shall i rescue thebes a certain degree of altruism accompanies his address he states that his sorrow is greater than the sorrow of the thebans because in his words your several griefs are single single and particular but my soul mourns for myself for you and for all thebes it is not clear at this stage whether it is regal altruism or an overweening sense of ego that propels him to find uh, an immediate cure for the disease that has afflicted his land nevertheless he sets in motion the process of discovery by sending off creon and uh, awaits creon's return with considerable anxiety the intervening moment he spends in uttering promises such as when he comes then call me base i put not in act what thing soever phoebus showeth me this is the first of many promises he makes throughout the play promises like prophecies are future oriented the possibility of their fulfillment or failure looks forward to an indefinite time in the future the prophecies accompanying oedipus's birth ironically suffuse every promise of altruistic benevolence that oedipus makes as a king to his people the promise to cast out the the criminal or the unclean personage responsible for thebes's pestilence is haunted by the spectral presence of the oedipus whom the king oedipus does not know the former oedipus is always on the verge of making a return in fact the the many vicissitudes and narrative insinuations that sophocles weaves his plot with keep the return of the spectral oedipus in abeyance um, his slow and 
inevitable return is punctuated by the way in which revelations are structured. Information shared in the form of reports are presented in such a way that they sustain the interest of the audience and create a space for suspense. This is exemplified uh, in Creon's first speech after his return from the Pythian shrine. When asked about, uh, when asked what news he brings from the god, he says, good news. I count all news as fortunate, however hard that he sues forth in good. Now, the idea that all news is good news marks Creon as a man of agency because he perceives the categories of uh, news and reports, either bad or good, as, as arbiters of action. <clears throat> the very fact that a piece of information or news has been received is a good thing because it will lead to the object of knowledge, although it may be hard to accept. Uh, this same sense of agency and curiosity characterizes uh, Oedipus, uh, although he is more inclined initially to interpret news as neither bad nor good, but either useful or useless. Uh, this reinforces his similarity with a detective uh, in response to Creon's remark that all news is used forth in good. He says, it is a response that finds me undismayed and yet not overbold. Creon offers Oedipus the option of hearing the news either in private or in public. Uh, the setting of the play and the unity of place uh, are structured by and large around the interior exterior dialectic. Uh, when Creon offers to tell Oedipus about the prophecy either in the presence of the audience or by going within the palace, the two worlds of Oedipus are suddenly evoked, uh, the public and the private, uh, and he chooses to listen to the prophecy in the presence of the Theban people, and thus he emphasizes that he wants a certain degree of clarity in the whole investigative process. <clears throat> And this uh, separates him from the detective per se, who sometimes works out the mystery uh, in their head uh, before revealing the investigative process to the reader. Uh, again, Oedipus's impulse is altruistic here. He says, uh, and I quote from the text, speak it to all since it is their distress I care for, I more than my life. What Creon comes up with is basically a riddle clue sent by the god Apollo, uh, which is uh, a fell pollution fed on Theban soil, ye shall drive out, not feed it past all cure. This is the first clue for Oedipus. The rest of Phoebus's message is narrated by Creon with uh, great suspense and economy. Whatever he says amounts to this. Laius's murder has gone unavenged um, and, uh, and that that is the reason behind the pestilence so Oedipus Oedipus's immediate response to this is uh, the task is hard how can we hope to track a crime so ancient where can they be found? According to the gods, says Creon, it will be found in Thebes. This consolidates the unity of place, one of the three unities in Aristotle's poetics. If the crime is to be detected, it must be detected within the Theban territory. In other words, although the crime was committed outside Thebes, its solution will be found inside its territory. Uh, Oedipus, after becoming the king of Thebes, had not inquired uh, the nature of Laius's murder or the motive behind the murder. Thus, it is with a kind of belatedness with which the event of Laius's murder is uh, reimagined. 
Oedipus, uh, assuming the role of the the prime investigator here, questions Creon. Uh, came none with the news, came none who journeyed with him back to report that you might learn and act. In other words, uh, was there any witness? How can we be assured of the veracity of the incident? To this, Creon answers that there was only one eyewitness who was able to escape and if his report is to be believed, King Laius was killed by a band of robbers. Uh, now, considering what actually happened and who actually killed Laius, the reference to the supposed robbers is uh, like a red herring, which may lead the investigator astray. Now, dubious though it may be, it is Oedipus's first clue, which gives him a lead in the case, as it were. Uh, he remarks, uh, Uh, that, and I'm quoting from the text, one clue disclosing many more, the first small promise grasped may teach us all. He is also skeptical of whatever report he is provided with and uh, he promptly questions the veracity of the account of the eyewitness. Uh, he is clearly not ready to believe the the improbable story that the former king was killed by robbers. Uh, he is clearly looking for a motive, a necessary precondition for any act of murder. And perhaps in his mind, a random act of robbery and murder cannot possibly be the reason of a devastating plague which has afflicted the whole of Thebes. So the reason behind the delay in the uh, investigation of Laius' murder is ascribed to the Sphinx and her riddles, uh, Creon says, and these are his words, it was the Sphinx whose riddling song constrained it to leave the unknown unknown and face the present. Um, it is ironic that years later the Thebans are made to face the present with the appearance of the plague. And in order to find a remedy, the unknown must now be made known. Oedipus takes stock of the situation and takes the responsibility of reopening and uh, investigating the case. So he assumes the role of the avenger of Laius's murder for reasons both public and personal. He believes that this act of driving out the evil will secure him as well as his uh, secure him as well as his uh, kingdom and in his words uh, he that slew his king were fain perchance again by the same hand to strike at me so fighting for you king i serve myself uh, this can be interpreted as an act of putting an end to the constant haunting of thieves and uh, Oedipus's kingdom by the dead King Laius. Uh, in punishing Laius's murderer, he will ironically unleash his former jinxed uh, spectral self which is buried within his present public regal persona. Oedipus's presence on stage is interspersed with uh, choric peons um, offered to the gods. Now, while this is a necessity, a theatrical necessity, it also ushers into full view the gravity and the impact of the crime committed by Oedipus before the play started. This spectral Oedipus, this invisible Oedipus operating outside the peripheries of the uh, Oedipus Rex text teases us into rethinking certain issues uh, that are fundamental to the play, such as crime, um, freedom, free will, uh, fate, and justice. Now, as the play progresses, uh, the spectral Oedipus becomes increasingly incarnated. The world of oracular prophecies uh, and divinations 
provide the characters, especially Oedipus, with a, a kind of repository of clues which will help him unravel the mystery. And Oedipus uses these clues as uh, like a modern day detective would use uh, forensic evidence. And they are actually scattered throughout the play and they emerge at vital junctures in the plot. In fact, uh, the oracular message brought in by Creon at the start, uh, it sets in motion the plot itself. And Oedipus is addressed to the gathered audience after the uh, third Goric passage is an instance of uh, instance of deep self introspection. Uh, in this passage, he considers his position as an outsider, a stranger to the fact, a uh, foreigner with no guide. So for him, being a Theban would place him in a better position to investigate the case. Nevertheless, he makes uh, one of his earliest moves as an investigator or a detective by convening a group of Thebans and asking them collectively whether any of them uh, knows who murdered Laius. He says, uh, is there among you one who knows what hand did murder Laius, son of Labdacus? That man, I charge, unfold the truth to me say that he fears by utterance to bring himself in accusation. Why? His payment shall not be harsh. He shall depart unharmed. Doth any no another citizen or stranger guilty? Hide it not. Reward I'll pay, and thieves shall add her gratitude. And this is followed by a grave proclamation. He says, this man, where he be, from all the land whose government and sway is mine, I make an outlaw. None shall speak to him, no roof shall shelter. In your sacrifice and prayer, give him no place, nor, drink, nor in drink offerings, but drive him out of doors, for it is he pollutes us as the oracle Pythian of Phoebus hath today revealed to me. <clears throat> now when Oedipus threatens that he will punish anyone who will shield the criminal, he is unknowingly referring to the characters in the play who know the criminal but will not tell, such as Tiresias. And when he talks about the punishment that is to be meted out to the criminal, he is anticipating the uh, convergence, the impending convergence between uh, the spectral Oedipus and the investigator Oedipus, uh, which leads to, uh, which will lead to yet another Oedipus in the future who, uh, who has been punished by his own proclamation, own royal proclamation. So there is a, uh, <clears throat> there is actually a rejoinder which is highly ironic, which is further if, with my knowledge in my house, he harbor at my hurt, on mine own head fall every imprecation he had pronounced. Uh, the house that he is talking about is incident incidentally Laius's house, where Oedipus has long harbored his self-identification with uh, uh, Laius, his empathy for Laius, uh, takes on an almost bodily significance. He, he says with magnanimity, Today, since I am king, where he was king, the husband of his bride, from whose one womb, had he been blessed with progeny, had sprung near pledges of our bond, his fruit and mine. Oedipus's eagerness to find and convict the criminal is proportional to the consolidation of his identity as a Theban. For Thebes has made him its king and has given its queen to him. Solving the riddle of the Sphinx gave Oedipus regal entry into, into Thebes. 
and now after the lapse of several years a plague has given him the opportunity to not only rip off his stranger identity but also prove his mettle as a ruler and leader uh, the chorus assumes a single singular identity and says that none of the thebans present know anything about the identity of the criminal and that the god apollo who sent the oracle should himself name the man uh, now apollo being a god cannot in himself appear and his oracle should be interpreted investigated and pursued with intellectual rigor which is a task that edipus readily undertakes and when the chorus next advises edipus to summon and seek counsel of the old prophet tiresias uh, edipus reveals that he has already sent for him now the mental process of detection uh, while investigation is underway often go unnoticed by people around the detective uh this is actually instantiated here and when the chorus whimsically uh, says the rest's old unmeaning talk edipus is prompt in responding what talk i must neglect no hint uh, like a true detective he wants to pay attention to every detail uh, afterwards tiresias is brought in not as a witness but an all knowing prophet uh, a figure whose presence would be impermissible in detective fiction tiresias is the only character in the play uh, who knows the three oedipuses the spectral oedipus of the past uh, oedipus the king or oedipus rex of the present and the blind outcast oedipus of the future <coughs> his knowledge tiresias's knowledge is so total that had it not been for his reluctance to reveal too much uh, the lies murder mystery would have been uh, brought to a, a resolution an untimely resolution now tiresias's reluctance is therefore as important as his all knowability uh, <clears throat> while watching the play the audience uh, is probably filled with curiosity as to why tiresias is reluctant to tell the truth and suspense is sustained as the conversation between oedipus and tiresias is lengthened and lengthened almost to the point where it becomes quarrelsome and unyielding tiresias's refusal to speak bewilders us as it bewilders oedipus it also infuriates infuriates him uh, infuriates him infuriates him so much so that he begins to suspect that tiresias must have been involved in the crime uh, oedipus says i see in the the plotter of the deed in the say for the blow the doer has our eyes then had i said the killing too was thine <clears throat> now it is interesting to note that here the conversation between oedipus and tiresias becomes so heated that the process of inv investigation is stalled for some time and they start slandering each other with accusations that seem uh very angry and very baseless as well <clears throat> however uh, in his anger oedipus does not realize that the accusations tiresias hurls against him uh, and the real meaning behind those accusations uh, for instance um, this line thou art foul and thou pollutest thieves thou sleekest and thou art the murderer 
uh, and also this line with thy dearest knowing not thou livest in shame seeing not thine own ill now tiresias restrains himself uh, eventually and says that everything will be out in time uh, oedipus is enraged to hear this and he says uh, two things that kind of reinforce uh, his pride and also his faith in intellectual uh, inquiry intellectual rigor uh, with regard to the with regard to problem solving uh, firstly he asks where was tiresias when the sphinx had posed a serious threat to the theban people and secondly he mocks tiresias for not being able to solve the sphinx's puzzle which called for in his words mantic skill not common human wit uh, and he says these are these are his words no birds no god informed you i the fool ignorant oedipus no birds to teach me must come and hit the truth and stop the song uh, there is clearly a sense of hubris intellectual superior superiority on Oedipus's part, which prevents him from uh, seeing the truth as it stands. Uh, <clears throat> the investigative logic that he applies is uh, based on reason and causality and evidence, and and curiously enough, he tries to supplant <clears throat> using this logic the prophetic scheme of things sometimes uh, knowingly and sometimes unknowingly um, and the chorus intervenes in the heated exchange between Tiresias and Oedipus and reminds them that God's decree must be fulfilled anger is perhaps not the best way to go about it um, Tiresias speech is elliptic and foreboding I think it's uh, it kind of uh, deserves to be quoted in its entirety and I will read out the speech I speak then thou hast taunted me for blind thou who hast eyes and dost not see the ill thou standest in the ill that shares thy house dost know whose child thou art nor see that hate is thine from my from thy own kin here and below now this is further complicated in the uh, in this passage where he says he whom thou this while hast sought with threatening and with publishings of lyas's murder that same man is here now called a stranger in our midst but soon he shall be known a theban born yet find small pleasure in it Blind that once had a sight, a beggar once so rich in a foreign land, a wanderer with a staff groping his way, he shall be known, the brother of the sons he fathered, to the woman out of whom he sprang, both son and husband, and the sire whose bed he fouled, he murdered. Get these, get thee in, and think and think, then if thou findest a, I lie, then say I have no wit for prophecy. Um, so we see that Oedipus's decision to enlist the aid of Tiresias uh, backfiring on him and bringing him closer to the catastrophe. Tiresias, before leaving, uh, he teases Oedipus with yet another riddle. He says, uh, this day shall give thee birth and shall destroy thee. This line can be interpreted as a reference to the transformation of the second Oedipus in the play. That is, the transition from Oedipus Rex to Oedipus, the blind itinerant beggar. Tiresias' subsequent clue is connected metaphorically to the riddle that I just mentioned. He says, 
he whom thou this while hast sought with threatenings and with publishings of Laius is murdered. That same man is here. So Tiresias's tragedy is that although he can see everything, that is figuratively see everything, he he cannot change the course of things. There is a choric commentary that follows, uh, which is a kind of a meditation on the question, how can things be known? How can a prophet know? Can a prophet know? Can a man know more than common men? Uh, the chorus raises uh, an important question or rather an important legal issue. Uh, the chorus says, until the charge be proven good, let the world cry guilty. Never will I consent with it. This, this question, this legal question, also this ethical question, that whether Tiresias' oblique prophecies are to be believed. Uh, this question helps, uh, among other things, sustain the suspense for the, for the moment. And Creon is enraged by Oedipus' accusation of treachery and he confronts Oedipus and what follows is yet another round of heated exchange uh, of words, of angry words. <coughs> this, however, is interspersed with certain significant questions uh, raised by both of them, both Oedipus and Tiresias. For example, how long is it since Laius disappeared? Was the prophet Tiresias uh, in his practice then? Uh, did he ever speak of Oedipus? Uh, why did Creon do nothing to investigate the death of Laius? Why did the why did the see, seer, the, the all-seeing seer, not tell uh, his story then? Uh, does Oedipus reign equally with Jocasta, Creon's sister? over all the realm uh, of Thebes. And of this unit, does Creon make an equal third? Creon actually uses syllogisms and he tries to explain that no one would choose the trouble uh, of the crown uh, with no repose and peace. When and Creon would not covet kingship for the sake of it when he could be a king by other means. He challenges Oedipus and he challenges Oedipus to test him and he asks him to go to Delphi and inquire whether he has brought back lies for prophecies. Creon actually makes an appeal to Oedipus's rational faculties, but to no avail. Uh, as an investigator, Oedipus is most likely to believe that Tiresias and Creon are conspiring against him rather than uh, realizing that he himself is culpable. Um, however, this squabble is uh, stopped by the uh, uh, stopped by Jocasta uh, and the chorus reminds Oedipus and Creon that now is not the time to quarrel and this is how uh, the schism between public good and personal grievances is brought in. Uh, later, after the departure of Creon, Oedipus and Jocasta engage in a very significant conversation where Oedipus expresses his great disapproval of Creon and Tiresias. Um, he believes that both of them have 
accused him of Lias's murder. And in order to ward off uh, Oedipus's misgivings, his uh, despair, Jocaster tells him a story. And this story is about the supposed inefficacy of the oracles. The story is the account of the son born to Laius and Jocasta who uh, it was prophesied would kill Laius. This son was left on a hillside to die with his ankles uh, pierced together. So when he was just three years, three days old, um, he was left to die, this child. Uh, when Laius was killed by a band of robbers, it was assumed that the prophecy was false. Uh, the recounting of this story triggers the gradual convergence of the two Oedipuses and therefore uh, the, uh, the anagnorisis happens. Now, um, since we are looking at the text as a kind of murder mystery, um, this whodunit format is finally brought around to a situation where where every effort by the investigator Oedipus to implicate someone to the crime turns it back on himself and this makes Oedipus go back to his past and recount how Apollo once had prophesied that he would one day kill his father and marry his mother and how he fled Corinth in order to avoid such a fate. Um, the fact that Laius was killed where the three highways meet, where a road from Delphi meets a road from Dolia, uh, first converges with an act of killing that Oedipus had committed years ago. And further interrogation of Jocasta and Investigation of details of Laius's murder deepens Oedipus's suspicion that the man he had killed was indeed Laius. <coughs> the two Oedipuses thus begin to come together. The servant who got away from the scene of Laius's murder remains the only witness. Oedipus calls on him for interrogation, but as it turns out, his arrival is delayed in order to kind of protract the suspense. It's a theatrical necessity. And in the next scene, however, the arrival of a messenger from Corinth with the news of uh, King Polybus's death is received as good news by Oedipus and Jocasta because it suggests that tragedy has been averted, uh, at least partially. However, the messenger's subsequent revelation that Polybus and Merope were not the biological parents of Oedipus sets in motion the whole drama of self-recognition and a confirmation through comparing information regarding Oedipus's birth, his, um, his abandoned by Laius, uh, the discovery and adoption by Polybus and Merope, the, the event of Laius's murder, the solution to the Sphinx's riddle, and the ascension uh, to the Theban throne of Oedipus's, um, uh, of Oedipus's severe and unthinkable culpability brings the investigation to its conclusion. Uh, although the events narrated in the story are causally held, Sophocles does not tell the story in linear fashion. Uh, if he had chosen to do so, we would see the murder first and then the aftermath of the murder, knowing all along uh, who killed Laius. Instead, the, instead um, 
softly structures it like a full-fledged murder mystery and begins towards the end of the story working out the plot backwards um, and Sophocles of course cannot be credited with the invention of the of the whodunit genre with certainty but he was indeed radical in his playwriting uh, to have subverted the genre by making the detective and the killer the same person. Oedipus is the king, the investigator, the judge and jury and eventually the convict. The gods are never completely removed and perhaps the fact that the the fact that Oedipus suffers for his deeds is in a degree reassuring, although it's terrible. At least there is a system in nature, effects have causes, and although those effects are pitiable and horrible, they may be better than a chaotic universe. It must be noted that the ancient Greek audience would have probably been familiar with the Oedipus myth and therefore to approach Oedipus Rex as a whodunit requires some degree of precaution although there is no doubt that Sophocles structures his play as a murder mystery.